The wind out of the Gobi Desert has pushed sand and silt into the Yellow River region, a thousand kilometers south of Beijing in the province of Shaanxi. Thousands of years have transformed these sediments into a compact form of soil called loess, and the Yellow River owes its name to the color of this earth. 40 million Chinese still live in these cave houses, or Yaodong, dug out of the high plateau. And out of this multitude, three lives, three destinies, three dreams. The cave master has a dream, to build one final Yaodong for his son, to whom he has passed on his tradition. Jing Lin, the miner, has a dream, to own a modern house with a roof in his distant native village. And to pay for his dream, he digs and digs into the lowest. His life is a constant struggle with the cliff. Yu Tsai had two dreams, to be elected mayor of the five villages in the valley, despite the fact that he is a member of the Muslim minority. That dream has been realized. The other is to marry off his favorite niece to a well-to-do young Muslim in the village. Zhu, the cave master, not only digs cave houses, he must also guarantee their solidity. He is the heir to this art, which has been passed down from father to son for 3,000 years. Chen, his son, has been trained by his father, but he has not yet reached the stage of master. Chen wants to dig a new Yaodong to live in with his wife and children. There's not enough space in the family cave where his father, his mother, and his two older brothers live. Chen needs his father's help to dig his new home. Master Zhu has spent his life building Yaodong. And at 76 years old, he is anxious to confirm Chen as his successor. Building the Yaodong is a family affair. Everyone usually participates. Although his two brothers are more valuable in the fields, they nevertheless respect the ancestral custom, the family meeting. Zhu and his family are Taoists. For them, it is unthinkable to undertake anything without first consulting the diviner. The diviner is the master of sites and dates. He determines the best location for building houses and burial sites, and the best times for weddings and feasts. He also sculpts stelles. The diviner connects the future Yaodong to the universe so that it will be in harmony with nature. He has inscribed the four cardinal points and the center of the courtyard on the ground. The center of the courtyard symbolizes the center of the universe.
With the help of his divining compass, the diviner questions the Earth's breath, since a sight is favorable or unfavorable, in harmony or not with the yin and the yang, the two cosmic principles which guide the lives of all Chinese. After having linked the center of the future Yaodong to his compass, the diviner interprets the trigram corresponding to the selected spot for building. The vibrations which cross heaven and earth on this site are favorable. Master Zhu and his family can dig without disturbance from the earth's breath. The dream takes shape. With his hands, the father sketches the cave in space, and his son draws it with his pick in the earth, the lowest. <laughs> Master Zhu is building his 888th Yaodong, 888, a lucky number. He is happy knowing that this one is for his own son. Thanks to new free market rules begun in the 1980s, Chinese peasants have become wealthier. Chen was the first in his village to transform his wheat fields into more profitable apple orchards. Master Zhu and his son now tackle the most sensitive part of the construction, setting the lowest bricks in place, thus guaranteeing the solidity of the structure. For the father, no two constructions are the same. He can read the nature of the lowest, its cracks and its folds. With lowest bricks and lowest mortar, this Yaodong blends into the Lois, and thanks to Master Zhu's know-how, it will last for centuries. Since 1973, couples living in cities can only have one child, those in the country, two. Chen and his wife had twin girls. However, they wanted a son, and so they preferred to pay a fine, try again, and were lucky enough to have a boy. Every day, the grandmother steam cooks the little wheat breads, the staple in this region, the equivalent of a bowl of rice in southern China. Young in spirit and enthusiasm, but with the aches and pains of an old man, Zhu is so buried in his work, he has forgotten his age. 
哎，我就孩子，我腰疼，我腰都疼的很。要找要找医生看的。嗯，去哪找？陪找医生给你看看去。嗯，今天天就该好的了。嗯，你看医生。哦，我去。Chen has hired his neighbors. He is the boss and he pays them like any other workers. In the past, villagers helped each other and practiced bartering. Today, they prefer money in order to buy consumer products in the city. A Yao Dong is four meters wide and six to ten meters deep. The important aspects of family life take place on the communal bed, the Kang. More than just a bed, it is the symbol of conviviality. The Kang is our mother, the peasants say. It is made of lowest brick heated in winter by a coal stove. The entire family sleeps side by side. School begins at 7 o'clock and the children leave before breakfast. They have two eating breaks during the day and don't finish school until 6 p.m. School has been compulsory only since 1985. The country has 150 million primary school children, and they all begin the week with a flag-raising ceremony. It wasn't very long ago that all schools in the region were caves. As they were too dark, the government outlawed them and replaced them with buildings. Pei Pei is faster with the abacus than her sister, Hui Hui. She even claims to be faster than the calculator of her uncle Wu, who lives in the city. Ten a.m. Breakfast time. Like all the villagers, Master Zhu, Chen, and the workers take a break. Once dug, the cave must dry for a few months. It will be a year before Chen and his family settle into their new yaodong. <laughs> This man, who made a fortune exporting apples, has already made use of Chen's services. Now he wants to enlarge his house, and he would like to rehire Chen and his team. Chen is embarrassed and has waited until evening to announce the news to his father. 
This new worksite cannot wait, and he will have to stop the building of his Yaodong. Master Zhu did not sleep well. He realizes that fewer and fewer Yaodong are being built and the tradition is fading. Soon his son will build only houses. He goes to talk to his old friend Wang, at whose home we see the local party boss, a young man of the new generation. <laughs> Chen will finish his Yaodong before the bad weather comes, and it will be warmer in winter, cooler in summer, and ten times cheaper than the concrete houses which party leaders dream of living in. Will it be the last Yaodong in the village, or will there be others? That is another story. Not far away in the same valley lived Jinglin, the miner, his wife and their little daughter. They have settled in an abandoned Yaodong, which they rent from the villagers. Jinglin works in the gypsum mine for 10 consecutive days, followed by one day off. He earns 700 yuan a month, about $85. Eight AM, Jing Lin and his team go down into the mine. <laughs> This morning, they will be the first team down. Three other teams, like theirs, work in other tunnels. Like every day, they talk about last night's TV soaps. For these migrant workers, television is their only distraction. Jing Lin doesn't own a television. Oh, 
300 meters down, lit only by acetylene torches and barely protected by their wicker helmets, the miners extract the gypsum. The generator is only used to lift the gypsum, or the earth, up to the surface. This painstaking work begins by loosening the earth with dynamite. Foreman evacuates the tunnels, places the explosives, and lights the fuse. From this moment, the last miners have only two minutes to take cover. After the explosion, all the miners wait on the surface for two hours, the time necessary for the tunnels to be ventilated and for the gas to dissipate. The vein looks like a good one. The mine owner has come in person to encourage his workers with little cakes and alcohol. <laughs> the festivities are over and the foreman calls his men back to work. <laughs> Jing Lin and his team come from the same village. They work in the mine on a seasonal basis, seven months a year, to make money. Then they go home to do the heavy work in the fields. They are going to spend the next eight hours on their stomachs at the bottom of the mine. They use primitive tools, and the atmosphere is stifling and humid. But Jinglin and his friends never complain. They want to get out as much gypsum as possible, since if they extract more than three tons a day, they receive a bonus. Each miner has a specific job, driller, shoveler, or even dynamiter. Jing Lin's task is to unload the wheelbarrow. Jinglin alone carries 12 800 kilogram loads a day, nine and a half tons of earth and gypsum. Backbreaking work for 30 yuan a day. <laughs> The house of his dreams cost 20,000 yuan, meaning at least another five years in the mine. Uh, 
Jing Lin doesn't want to buy a television. It's becoming a running joke among the miners who poke fun at him during eating breaks. The purest blocks of gypsum resemble alabaster and are sold to craft workshops to make good luck pillows, which are placed under the neck and are reputed to cure all ills. All the rest of the production supplies a plaster factory. Jing Lin is determined to save money. All he thinks about is his own house in his own village. His wife, Xiao Ling, however, dreams of owning a TV set. In this Yao Dong, high on the cliff, the miners' wives wait for their husbands. The women encourage Zhao Ling to buy a TV set since tomorrow is her husband's payday. <laughs> the earth is a dragon whose breath must be contained. By digging tunnels, the miners risk wounding the earth, cutting its veins. And so to contain the dragon's breath, the owner of the mine has a pig brought in as an offering. This ritual takes place once a year, and even more often when the men want to thank the earth for the prosperity it has given them. After the prayers, the miners share the sacrificed pig. Well, half of it. The other half will be sold by the boss for his own personal profit. Jing Lin moves slowly. He's tired. Cao Ling is waiting impatiently for him. She's prepared a small feast, ravioli. She intends taking him to his foreman's house to watch television and thus convince him to buy one. It will be important later on in the education of their daughter. Thanks to television, she can learn Mandarin, the language of city people, and more useful than the dialect she speaks. <laughs> The majority of miners are either bachelors or they live far from their families. Thus, their only distraction is spending the evening at their foreman's house in front of the television. <laughs> <laughs> Cao Ling and the foreman's wife are confident. Jing Lin is watching the film with interest. <laughs> Xiao 
Xiao Ling has won. Jinglin leaves for the city. This is the first time Jing Lin has ever set foot in Yuancheng, a city with a population of half a million, a small town by Chinese standards. Jing Lin is a man of the soil. He is surprised by everything and tempted by nothing. Owning a TV set, however, is beginning to interest him. He thinks about Cao Ling's dream and his daughter's future. Television would enable them to witness changes in China and in modern life. Later on, he would like his daughter to continue her education and work in the city. He has carefully folded up the rest of his money in his newspaper. He's gone without soup and drunk hot water instead. All he's bought to eat is a small steamed bread, but he has his television set. He'll eat better and more cheaply tonight at home. As they wait for Jing Lin to bring home the new treasure, the women discuss their children's education. They would all like them to find good jobs and live in beautiful apartments with tinted glass, like those they see in television series. The arrival of a TV set in this village of seasonal workers is a great event. Everyone has something to say about it. Cao Ling feels proud. The precious box is placed in a nook of Lois at the far end of the cave. 
What does it matter that Cao Ling doesn't have electricity yet? What's important is that she has her TV. Jing Lin will continue to save up until he can build his dream house. A real house with a roof in his village, 800 kilometers away. Honor to our elders, declares Yu Tsai, who has just created a Golden Age Association. As a result of the one child law, older people in China outnumber the young, and old age pensions do not exist. A heavy load for households which have to feed four elders. The association's goal is to provide relief for these families. Yu Tsai is the mayor of five villages, and he lives, like 40 million other Chinese, in a Yaodong. For months, he has been busy organizing his niece's wedding, now two days away. Like 35 million Chinese, Yu Tsai is a Muslim, and his wife is wearing her white bonnet, traditional in China for Muslim women. In Taoist China, Muslims constitute a large minority community. Yu Tsai, along with the future husband and the latter's father, attend the important Friday prayer session. Only five years ago, the mosque was a cave set up in a Yaodong. Times have changed, however, and now they prefer a brick mosque. It is the preferred place to discuss important matters, especially during the ritual ablutions. And the major event in the Muslim community is the impending wedding. The Imam of the mosque is a teacher in the secular world. He is the only Chinese Muslim in the village who can read and write Arabic. The Imam is preparing traditional Chinese good luck banners for the wedding. On the eve of the wedding, the community gathers at the graves of the future husband's ancestors. 
Each Chinese family is linked to its ancestors and informs its dead of all important events in order to be protected by them. One of the groom's sisters becomes very emotional over the memory of her late mother. Although Yu Tsai is a mayor and a politician, he remains a good peasant. He harvests enough wheat from this field to feed his family. The day before the wedding is also the moment for gifts. Yu Tsai has decided to buy a lamb from the village shepherd. He will give half of it to each family. Bargaining is a matter of principle and courtesy. Yu Tsai has asked the Imam to kill the lamb according to Muslim ritual. Its throat is cut facing Mecca to the west in China. The bride's parents live in a traditional Yaodong. Tomorrow, they will watch their daughter leave to live in a modern house. <laughs> the groom's best men come to fetch the guest's wedding presents. <laughs> Quilts are a traditional gift. The bride is required to have at least eight. <laughs> Yu Tsai, as the matchmaker, is officially responsible for the smooth running of the wedding preparations. He is also responsible for checking that the dowry meets the pledges previously made. <laughs> the chests are locked in his presence. A truck has already taken away the family's gifts, which make up most of the dowry. A washing machine, a bicycle, a TV set. <laughs> The big day, early morning. <laughs> the ceremony and the banquet will take place at the groom's parents' home. They have just moved into a brand new house.
It is the same house in which the new bride will live, under the guardianship of her mother-in-law. In traditional China, Chinese brides, Muslim or otherwise, were always totally veiled. But in communist China, they have adopted the flowered tiara. Although the girl has known her fiancé since childhood, the moment she must leave her family is very emotional, since she is literally being given to another family. It's a sudden and total break, making her no longer part of her clan. Yu Tsai's niece leaves the Yaodong of her childhood forever to live with her husband under her mother-in-law's roof in a brick house at the other end of the village. After the prayers and speeches, it is time for the cash gifts. Rich or poor, everyone gives according to his means. Yu Tsai announces the names of the donors and the newlyweds bow in gratitude. Then come the bawdy remarks about the wedding night and the children the couple are going to begin making. And so ends the reverie of the fiancé from the Yaodong, and thus begins the dream of the young bride in a real home. Jing Lin, in front of his Yaodong, which looks like the mine in which he works, is strengthened by his will, his stubbornness, and his dream. He doesn't move mountains, he digs into them, and he will keep digging until one day, 800 kilometers away, in his village, a house will rise up. <laughs> Remembering one's elders, the ancestor cult, dwells in the heart of every Chinese, regardless of his religion. <laughs> The cave master no longer dreams of a new construction, but only of a memory to keep alive. Chen, his son, has finished his Yaodong, but it is undoubtedly the last one the father will dig. Modern brick houses continue to replace the lowest caves. In front of him is his grandson, this five-year-old boy, who doesn't quite understand what his grandfather expects of him. Behind him, the ancestors and his father and mother in their wooden frame. Who is this, the old man asks. It's great-grandfather, answers the child. His name is Tzu Sui. Tzu Sui, says the old man. 
And she's Chang. Chang. Ah, you knew that. Good. Come, come. Listen to your grandfather. After I'm gone, will you put my picture here? You must remember your ancestors. You will remember me, won't you? <laughs> 